So please allow me to continue in English, but um, if I speak too fast or if you don't understand me, please put up your hands. I'll ha be happy to answer. Um, I'm sad to say, actually, my story is not as... Um, I think I was not as blessed or fortunate uh, as my co-panelist to be one of those people who actually search for answers uh, in their life. In fact, I think I was the opposite. Uh, and my fear is that there are too many people like me outside in this world uh, who feel that they're very complete the way they are. Life is good, there's nothing really wrong, why should I search? I mean, all these questions about God, no God, is there a purpose to life? There is no purpose to life, is there life after death? I won't really know, so why should I even ask? And if I ask, the people who tell me are human beings just like me, so why would they know any better than me? I was a little bit like that. Um, maybe let me start by saying how my life began. I was born, alhamdulillah, into a wonderful Buddhist, uh, wonderful Chinese family, happened to be Buddhist, um, the usual. Not Buddhist in the true sense, which I later learned. Um, they were just, basically my mum grew up praying to the idols because my grandmother taught her to, and probably my grandmother was taught by her great-grandmother to, and, but she didn't really know why. Uh, and certainly if I asked her things like, Mom, so what's the purpose of life? She wouldn't be able to really answer me because she wouldn't really know anyway. But just do it, like, you know, because grandma does it, so you better do it, kind of thing. And I'd be like, okay, 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 if I don't do it, then I'm not being a good daughter. But that was it. Uh, alhamdulillah, my life was very smooth. Um, through school, I had good grades. Uh, being Chinese, what else is there, right? Do well in school, get a good job, buy a big car, buy a nice house, have kids, and you know, you will be happy. That is the mantra. So that was my focus in life as well. And I was gauging my life as being very successful. Because according to that mantra, I was doing well in school. Um, I graduated. Uh, I got a good job. Uh, my life, my, my job was in fact very interesting as well. I got to travel a lot. I got to meet people from high society. Uh, alhamdulillah, finances were good. Everything was fine. I had a good job. I, I was, I thought, popular. So I actually had no emptiness in my life. And frankly, sadly, I never looked. I never felt that I need to look for something, right? Because to me, religion was something that people who needed some spiritual fulfillment would look for it. Maybe because something happened to them and they feel like they needed answers or they felt empty inside. Partying every night and then they feel empty inside. I didn't have any of that, so I thought I was fine. When I was in university, I decided since I was born Buddhist, I should find out more a little bit about my religion. So I joined the Buddhist Society and I learned about Buddhism. And um, I thought, yeah, it makes sense. And Buddhism is a very practical kind of religion. It teaches you about principles of life, uh, detachment, don't get too attached to material things. Everything made sense. Um, but there was one thing that was missing, though. It didn't bug me, it didn't bother me, but it was missing, and I didn't realize it was missing. From young, from the time my mom would make me kneel before that altar and pray, I always believed in God. I didn't know how I was supposed to pray to Him. I didn't know the way I was doing it was wrong, but I knew that there was a God. I didn't believe that there was no God. Um, and Buddhism didn't answer that. It didn't tell me who God was because Actually, if you read into it, Siddhartha Gautama never said, the, the, uh, the founder of the Buddhism, never denied the existence of God. It's just that the principles of Buddhism don't deal with the Creator. They don't talk about whether or not there is a God. It just talks about other things. So I was fine, life was good. And then, uh, some years later, Alhamdulillah, Allah destined that I would be introduced to a Muslim uh, who himself was a revert and he was running some Islamic classes uh, at his center uh, and I was very surprised because he became Muslim when he was a teenager uh, and by that time he had been Muslim 30 over years and he was having classes in English so first of all that was a shock to me because I thought Islam is Malay, right? How come there's Chinese people like teaching Islam in English? So, and then I went to the classes and then it was like, oh, 
It's all Chinese people. And then I saw, oh, Indians. And then I saw Mat Saleh. So for the first time, it struck me that Islam was not Malay. Um, and then I said, okay, fine. Uh, let me go find out what it's all about. And frankly, I was shocked. I was very, very shocked to discover what I discovered about Islam. It answered questions which I never thought to even ask myself. And that when I realized, I, when I had the answers to it, and I realized if I had asked, I couldn't find the answers anywhere else. And I can tell you, I'm a lawyer by training, by the way. So I am trained to think logically. I am trained to ask a lot of questions. And I'm trained to never be satisfied with anything that is illogical. So if you try to tell me something, um, and I, if I try to ask you something and you answer me something shady or wishy-washy and say something like, you know, it's kind of like this, but anyway, don't ask too much. You just believe. That is something that I would never have been able to accept. And Islam... The Islam that I was taught, the Islam that I knew, encouraged questions. It was never afraid of questions like in case, you know, they didn't have the answer. And to me, that meant it was true, right? Every question that I had, they always had the answer. And the, the answers were so logical, reasonable, and amazing that every time, the more I asked, the more I was sure that this religion is from the one who made me, the one who created me. Um, I was very surprised and I think it was a slow process as well. It wasn't like, huh, overnight, Hidayah, you know, I want to become Muslim. Um, it took me a while to learn, uh, but eventually I came to a point where I kind of decided that I couldn't deny it anymore. I felt like I did have a choice. It's not whether I want to be it was like this is the truth you either you accept the truth or you ignore it but it doesn't stop becoming the truth just because you ignore it uh, and that's when I decided that um, I wanted to uh, take my shahada uh, that was about six years plus ago and I would say that my journey in Islam since I took the shahada uh, has been even more colorful more meaningful um, Islam is like this, I don't know how to explain it, especially to the non-Muslims in the audience. Um, I think I, what, what I would say is that, and it ties a lot to the question or, or the topic at hand, uh, why am I living in this world? It is, you can live very well never asking this question. And there are many people in this world who are I wouldn't say blessed, it can actually be a curse actually. Uh, they're blessed with so much, they never have to ask this question. Um, but I think in the last few days we've had a very big reminder and that reminder is really the, the one that makes us realize we should ask this question and that is death. You have to, we have to know why we're living in this world because we will not continue living in this world forever. That is a fact. If we could say that we will live forever and never die, then you may not need to ask this question because you know whether or not you know why you're living, the fact is you'll forever be living, right? But if you know that it's not going to be forever and that is death, and MH370, if anything, tells us that death can strike us at any time, anywhere, any nationality, any age. Yesterday, my niece, she was crying her heart out because um, if you read about it, there was a bus from Catholic High School in PJ that was uh, driving towards, they went to Hululangat for some leadership camp, and it crashed. And the 17-year-old boy who died in that crash was her friend. Um, you die at 17, Chinese boy, Catholic high school. You know, it doesn't mean you, everyone gets to live until they're 70. It doesn't mean that everyone will have the chance to get a good job, buy a house, buy a car and get married. You could die tomorrow. And then that makes you ask, so if I'm going to die, then is there something that I'm meant to do while I'm still living? And the next question is, 
Why should I know if there is something that I'm meant to do while I'm still living? If there is no difference, whether you know or you do not know, it's something out there anyway when I die, I'll find out, and it wouldn't matter anyway for me to know now, then, then you wouldn't have to search and you wouldn't have to find the answers. But, and as Islam tells us, as Allah has tell, told us, and the believers here will tell you, we know the one who has made us has told us, in fact, the one who has made us has warned us that this life is only for a short while. For some people, it's shorter than others. Some can die in, uh, as a teenager, some die when they're older. But the point is, everybody who eventually will die. And then the one who has created us has told us, after you die, there will be another life. And that life is the hereafter. And in that afterlife, in the Akhira, you will either be sent to heaven, paradise, which is eternal. Eternal as in your life on earth is like a drop of sand in a vast desert compared to the life of the eternal. So logically, if you and I know, right, that we're living in this house, looks quite nice, kind of nice now, and, and I'm telling you that it's going to crumble one day, but you've got a chance to escape, and you can drive now to this beautiful island where you can live forever and ever and have like a thousand servants to serve you and life will be perfect. You will never be angry, you will never be sad, everything is perfect. You would want to do that, wouldn't you? And that is a question I never asked. Before, I thought, okay, I have a really nice house. So why should I even think about driving to this island, which I don't know whether this island exists? And then how do I know that the direction that I'm driving is correct anyway? So I was happy to just stay in the house. But I was blind because I didn't realize that one by one, all my neighbors, the houses were collapsing around me. I mean, it was, it was very obvious, okay, that everyone will eventually die. Uh, so when it hit me, and when, when, I, when I learned about Islam, and I found all these answers to questions which I never even thought to ask because I was very blind, frankly. Um, I saw the beauty of it, and obviously, obviously I wanted to get in the car and drive to paradise, you know. Um, and there is a warning. Islam, Allah comes to us with glad tidings as well as a warning. Um, that if you don't believe in his message, then it will be hellfire for you forever and ever, and just as a drop of sand in this life versus the rest of your life in hellfire. And it's very scary. To the one who really believes, it's very scary. To the one who may or may not believe, I'm telling you now, you know what? Your house is going to crumble anyway. Whether you like it or not, your house is going to crumble. Because find me a single person in this world who has escaped death beyond 150 years old, 160 years old. That doesn't exist, right? So if you know your house is going to crumble, don't you think, for your own sake, we ought to look for uh, some map that might, find that, that might bring us to that beautiful island forever, you know? If we find it, alhamdulillah, look back and say, oh, thank God I got to the island before my house crumbled. If, if I'm wrong, if everybody in this audience, if all the Muslims in this world is wrong and, and you know, there is no island and whatever, there is no loss. Now, obviously, Muslims will, will never say that there is, and we know for a fact that there is. But do yourselves a favor. If you haven't asked that question, please ask that question. Please take the trouble to find that map and look for that island and I can tell you Islam is somewhere if you searched with sincerity with an open heart inshallah Allah will open if you come walking to him he will come running towards you and I also want to say um, having found the meaning of life or the reason why I'm here um, I'm very worried because it's not it's not like you hop in the car and definitely you get to the island, you know. Uh, there are a lot of roadblocks around the way. There are a lot of temptations. You can make a wrong turn. You might end up back in the house or worse, still drive yourself to hellfire. Uh, and therefore, my message to myself first and to the Muslims in this audience is the message in uh, that Allah sends us in 
Surah Al Asr. He tells us that time is running out. Yeah, he swears by time because time is the one thing that definitely is going to disappear, uh, and time is running out. And he says that Inna uh, Insana Lafi Khusr, we mankind are in a loss, and it's not just small loss; it's big, huge, major, irreversible loss. Except for those who believe, and the problem is, a lot of us think the the surah ends at those who believe, which is not true. Yeah. Ilaladina amanu. He doesn't say ilaladina aman. Full stop. He goes on. Wa amilu salihat. Wa tawasau bil haki. Wa tawasau bil sabr. Which means all of us here. It's not guaranteed we're in the car, we're definitely going to make it to the island. Allah tells us, you want to get to the island, you've got to do four things. You've got to put the petrol, you've got to start the engine, you got to, you know. And these are the four things. Believing is one thing, la ilaha illallah. But the other thing that I want to remind myself first, and I really hope that I will stay on the right track until I die. Secondly, amilus salihat, do good deeds. And doing good deeds doesn't mean just going to the masjid to pray. Yes, alhamdulillah, that is the shield, that is what protects us, salah. But certainly it is not the end of it. And good deeds, mashallah, Allah has told us so many, He's given us the kitab to tell us all the kind of things that He considers as good deeds. Salam, smiling to your parents, being a good daughter, being a good son, being kind to your friends, picking up rubbish from the road, all of this is righteous good deeds. But we have to do it. We have to do it every day because there's four conditions. It's not just one condition. La ilaha illallah, full stop. Thirdly, he tells us, Utawasaw bil haqq, calling others to the truth. And this is something that I feel really sad about because as a revert, I feel that when Allah gave me Hidayah, He gave me this huge blessing that there is nothing in this world that can, can compare to it. If he did not have mercy on me and guide me to Islam, I would be lost forever. And I am sad to say, until that day that I went to meet that person, the Muslim revert who taught me about Islam, nobody ever taught me about Islam. I had many friends. I had a lot of Muslim friends. Yeah, Maybe not too many, but enough. Not a single one told me what Islam was. I did not know about Tawheed. Nobody told me don't pray to the idols. Nobody told me that there is only one God. Nobody told me I had a chance to get to paradise and if I didn't believe that I would go to hell, nobody warned me. And that is something we as Muslims must remember. Third condition, calling others to the truth. It is a condition. It's not if you like it, do it. If you don't like it, that's fine. It's not. Yeah, it's an obligation. And I would encourage all of us here today, uh, those of us who have that gift, it is very selfish to keep the gift to yourself and not share it with others. Even convey even one ayah. That's what Rasulullah Wasallam has advised us, right? You don't have to be an ustaza or ustaz or sheikh. You just need to be able to tell your friend a little bit through your akhlaq, whatever it is, just that attempt to call others to goodness. And finally, um there was always sober patience yeah patience there will be trials there will be hardships yes we have to bear it with patience and also in the the field of da'wah uh hidayah comes from allah our obligation is not to make other people muslim our obligation is to try to convey the message and then be patient